Good morning. Well, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm alive and alert today. Uh, yeah, sorry. Right. Maybe we'll do that again. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, there we go. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this, the first event of VIU's Arts and Humanities Colloquium Series for 2017. I'm Dr. Tim Lewis, Chair of the VIU History Department, and it's my honor to once again be serving as an event moderator for the Colloquium Series this year. In a moment, I will call on Myron Makepeace of VIU's Department of Music to introduce today's speaker, his colleague, Professor James Mark. But first, I have a few important duties to perform. First, please keep in mind and uh, be respectful of the fact that whenever we meet here at VIU and throughout Greater Nanaimo, we do so on the traditional territory of the Sunemo First Nation. Secondly, on behalf of the Colloquium Planning Committee, I'd also like to express our sincere thanks to all those who work in the Office of the Dean of Arts and Humanities, led by Dr. Ross McKay. This series could not continue uh, without their financial and moral support. Um, lastly, uh, congratulations to all Arts and Humanities graduates who will be having their degrees conferred, conferred upon them later this afternoon at our spring convocation. We very much thank them for making us a part of their life journey, and we're honored to do so, and we certainly wish them all the best. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems more and more these days that our old world is, well, kind of out of tune. Um, and to be honest, it's making me just a bit troubled. And having to cope with individuals or things that are out of tune is just one of the challenges, apparently, that face those who are blessed or cursed with the gift of perfect pitch, as is our speaker for today, James Mark. And as that's all I've got in the way of clever segues, uh, to tell you a little bit more about James and his topic for this morning is his fellow music department member, Myron Makepeace. Myron. Um, James asked me to uh, introduce him. Um, he was hoping that someone who taught him when he was a student at VIU would, would do that. Um, I'm not sure why, maybe to point out how old I am, or possibly uh, to tell some uh, funny or amusing anecdote about the uh, precocious student or something. Uh, or maybe I can try to take credit for some of his success, but actually none of those things are going to work so well today for me. But I will say that, that it's uh, quite, a, uh, quite an honor and uh, very you know, gratifying to have a former you know, student, an excellent student, return to join us as a colleague. And uh, you know, I think uh, um, after leaving here and going to York University and then down south to uh, Cal Arts for graduate work um, and quite an exceptional career as a professional performer. James brings uh, you know, a real wealth of experience and knowledge to our department and it's been a, quite a pleasure working with him and uh, <clears throat> um, in the last couple of years as a chair of the department uh, I would say he's worked very hard to try to strengthen and improve our department and, and I want to use this opportunity to express my appreciation for that because it's, it's not an easy job, I think. Um, maybe a few words about the topic today. Um, I can't say much about perfect pitch or absolute pitch, or, which are both kind of bad names for long-term pitch memory, so I'm looking forward to hearing what, what James has to say about his experiences. But more broadly, the topic of pitch. Um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about his thoughts on that. It's been an interest of mine for some time, and uh, sadly, kind of virtually non-existent in most uh, theory and uh, music courses, um, despite being really foundational to any understanding of Western harmony and theory and composition and performance practice. So it's, it's really great that he's chose this topic. I'm looking forward to it. For me, <coughs> the idea of having a piano with 12 notes between C and C or a guitar with 12 frets uh, and being taken as something natural or universal even has been kind of a problematic paradigm for me to grapple with with students and in my own work. And certainly as a student of American music, 
uh, and more broadly ethnomusicology that you spend 10 minutes with a, an American blues record and you find out someone dragging a knife along the strings to avoid those 12 frets um, or other places like studying music in India, finding out that people there prefer the natural, pure acoustic resonances, which maybe James will say more about what, what exactly that is. But tuning in really to, I could say, cosmic kind of resonances and hence the, the notion that in, in that music that every note is the voice of God. Whereas in our system we chose to compromise all that with a temperament and hence all the pitches in fact being somewhat out of tune. It's kind of an interesting cultural difference there between one that tunes into spiritual resonances versus something that compromises all of them. Um, anyway, I think that's interesting. But um, lastly, maybe if you have find it interesting today and you wonder on your way home or later in the day if this will affect your lives. Some of you I know play instruments and some play the guitar maybe, for instance. I know Ross just brought a guitar from, from Toronto maybe and uh, get it out of the box and you tune up the guitar so you can play it and play a chord, tune it all up, better check another chord, play another chord, hmm, not quite right, tune it, a couple more, go back to the one you started with, hmm, now it's out of tune and you kind of go around and around for a while, hence the joke about guitar players which is you know, they spend half their life tuning the guitar and the other half playing out of tune. Um, which I know that some of you have heard me tell that joke before, but it's funny because it's pretty much true. Um, but anyway, uh, it's not your fault if that's your experience with the guitar and Ross, don't take the guitar back to Toronto and say, Sean, you sold me a defective guitar. It's not the guitar, it's the tuning system. It does not work if you want things to be in tune. And uh, yeah, kind of a frustrating but it helps if you have some understanding of what that problem is about and the solutions we've attempted to, to solve that. Anyway, um, maybe that's enough from me. So yeah, I hope you enjoy the talk. I'm sure you will. And um, I'm proud and it's a great pleasure to introduce James Mark. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Myron for introducing me. I uh, really wanted to have somebody uh, who was at school, as he mentioned, uh, when I was a student here, to uh, introduce me to uh, the colloquium today. Um, I've got my first slide. I'm going to try to use my phone and uh, see if that works. Hopefully I don't uh, get any phone calls. But um, I've got my first slide here, with any luck. No, of course, it's not going to work. Aha! It is going to work. So uh, I put this slide up because uh, I wanted to start with my thank yous first before I get into anything else. Um, I, I have a wonderful network of people that I get to uh, work with, uh, Myron being one of those. Um, but this, this particular comic uh, is up in uh, one of uh, the offices up in the Arts and Humanities, and I get to see this every, every time I go up there. And uh, so I have a wonderful uh, group of people that, uh, that are here with us. So I wanted to thank some of them. Uh, obviously, the uh, Office of the Arts and Humanities, Ross McKay, uh, and his staff there uh, as the chair of the department, they are absolutely uh, wonderful and they make my job uh, pleasant in many, many ways by essentially doing a lot of the work for me, which is wonderful. So thank you. Uh, and I also wanted to uh, thank the Colloquium Committee for putting this together. This is a, a, an absolute honor for me to be here and to present. So thank you uh, for all your hard work. And uh, I wanted to thank uh, obviously my colleagues in the music department. I feel like uh, I grew up in Nanaimo and then I went away and now I've come back. And a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, groups I've been a part of while I was in Nanaimo have really shaped and molded uh, my career. Uh, namely uh, VIU, uh, which was back then uh, Malaspina University College. And uh, also uh, places like the Symphony, the Vancouver Island Symphony, which uh, allowed me to play when I was still in uh, high school and they actually would uh, have a student program that actually paid students. So my, my job when I was a student was to play in the symphony and get performance experience uh, before I returned to join them as a professional. Um, I think I get paid more now, a little bit more, than I did when I was a student, just, just a hair. But uh, fantastic that they have a, a wonderful program like that. And then also the uh, Nanaimo Conservatory, which is a, uh, uh, an organization that used to actually be based out of 
the uh, music building. Uh, one of the offices uh, that belongs to Sasha Kerber now used to be the main office for uh, the Central Vancouver Island Music School, as it was called then. Uh, and I spent many years since about 1986 in that building uh, until I graduated in 97. No, yeah, uh, so yeah, 97. Uh, in that building, taking lessons uh, on, under uh, people like Halvik and, and Marlon Wolf. So I really wanted to thank uh, this community, thank Nanaimo for all the things that it's done for me. Uh, so I'm, uh, it's a real honor for me to be a part of that. So I'm going to try this one. Check. Hello. Well, there we go. Uh, so before we get to, too far along in the um, presentation, I wanted to bring up a bunch of definitions and talk about some of the uh, different um, terms that, that might uh, not be there at the tip of your tongue for non musicians. So I'm going to start with uh, looking at how sound waves work. And uh, with any luck, I can just advance that here. So there's a, a photo of what sound waves actually look like. When we see images of sound waves, they generally look like water waves. But in the case of sound waves, they're not that. They're, they're pressure waves that move across um, uh, through the air, essentially. Yeah, they move through the water if they need to. But uh, essentially, that's what it looks like uh, through the neon strobe. And in terms of graphing it, we tend to make it look like that. So you've got, uh, essentially, if I'm just going to switch hands here and, uh, and try some from Fandango technology. Uh, no, it's already failed. I'm, I'm skipping ahead. I'm going to press this button here. There we go. So uh, if you guys have a look here, this is essentially graphing out your uh, areas of compression and areas uh, of, of non-compression, what we call rarefaction. And uh, so that's not what the wave actually looks like. It's just graphing uh, high pressure waves, and then it's graphing the, the part behind that, which is the, uh, the rarefaction, which is the, the lack of pressure uh, that falls behind it. And uh, when you have a look at the previous slide, you can see that there's those, those bands of color and then there's those bands of, of non-color. The bands of color were essentially showing that compression and the bands of non-color showing the, the rare fashion, which is the uh, part that falls. So uh, for a cycle to occur, you have to have an area of compression and an area of rare fashion. And then you uh, get a wavelength. So if you have a look at the slide up here, they've essentially shown you a wavelength being from this point of the compression through a, an area of rare fashion and then compression. And that's how they actually scientifically measure what a note uh, actually sounds like. Uh, and they use a term called frequency. Uh, while I'm on this slide, I'm going to point out uh, amplitude as well. So you'll see that uh, amplitude is on the left-hand side. Uh, and that's, again, a measure essentially of, of pressure. So you're seeing uh, this area of pressure on the uh, compression side and then the, the lack of pressure on this side. And we essentially look at that as volume. So this is what it looks like in a scientific approach, and it's called amplitude. And a lot of people talk about amplitude and volume, but they're not the same thing. But there's a direct correlation, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that more. So those are just a few things in that uh, uh, slide there that uh, will help us along our talk. So looking at amplitude, I've already mentioned it. Uh, essentially, you're looking at how much uh, error particles are being displaced. Uh, from their sort of their relative mean, and uh, we experience that as a listener as, as loudness. So we actually, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you actually equate uh, more volume or more pressure essentially as as a, as, as a loudness, and we can measure loudness in a different uh, quality called uh, decibels, uh, which is I'm not going to get into today. Uh, it's a whole other conversation. But, but essentially, uh, you're looking at the scientific versus the experiential. So amplitude is the scientific side and then uh, allow us to see how we experience this now. So. Uh, the other scientific measurement for uh, pitch uh, is, is frequency. So it's essentially a scientific approach to being able to measure um, different sounds. And it's actually measured in hertz. So uh, it's basically the number of cycles that happen in a second. Uh, so you, uh, in that previous slide, where you, I showed you the actual graph of compression uh, and rarefaction happening. It would be one cycle of compression and rarefaction happening per second. So at our tuning note of A440, you're seeing uh, 440 times in a second, it goes through a cycle of compression and rarefaction. And that would be a, a, an actual um, scientific way of measuring that pitch. Whereas uh, us as listeners, we generally think of pitch as a... Uh, 
as an experience. We don't, we don't actually measure it. When I hear uh, notes I have uh, in my perfect pitch, I don't sit there and go, oh, there's, there's 440 cycles going by. That's my brain that figures that out and, and relates it to something, uh, something that I've known as the, the note A. Um, so I don't sit there and count frequency. Uh, we, we represent that. This is, a, I realize this is a tough slide to uh, see, but it basically gives you the range of, uh, of frequencies on the actual piano. So uh, here's our lowest note on the piano, and we're looking at 27 hertz uh, here. So this is 27 cycles in a second to get that longest note, uh, or that lowest note. Rather. And the uh, lowest note on the piano, uh, when you think about it, our, our, our range of hearing goes from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Um, we would call it 20k instead of 20,000, just to, to make our lives easier. So uh, just to get to the very end of our, our the top one of the piano, we're at 4k, 4,000 hertz. Uh, is, is up here. So uh, it's not a very, uh, uh, our, our range of hearing actually can go much much higher beyond that, but it can't go much lower beyond that. So uh, it's a few notes lower than that and you actually can't hear it in your body. You'll feel it, you'll feel it in your chest, but you don't actually uh, experience it in your ears. So. Okay, um, uh, there's a bunch of instruments just to give you an idea of where instruments lie up in there. Uh, the violin, for example, sits from about uh, G below middle C, and then it goes all to the top of the piano uh, up here. Um, you can actually go off the fingerboard and go higher, but we don't need to go there today. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, pitch, give you guys some, uh, some background on pitch. Uh, again, it's the, uh, the actual property of, of uh, sound that uh, allows us to hear whether things are higher or lower. So we talk about things being a higher pitch or a lower pitch. So if I play two notes on the piano, you might not know what they are, but you know that the first one I played is higher than the, than the other one, uh, than the lower one. So uh, we basically talk about pitch as, as being uh, a way of essentially putting notes in a, in a value system, and, and uh, as musicians we've created scales and quantified them in such a way. So we don't think of uh, frequencies when we play notes, uh, we just think of pitches. As musicians. So we've taken the science out of it and we've uh, made it a little bit more uh, spiritual, as my Byron said. So this is the funny thing about pitch, is if I talk about octaves, and if you don't know what I mean by octaves, it's basically taking uh, a note like this one here and then playing the same note again up here. And they sound the same, but they're not actually the same note. One's higher than the other, but they belong to what we call the same pitch class, which means they're both the note C. And uh, we hear that being one octave apart. And above that, we get this C, and then we get another C above that, and then another C. And it just seems like we're adding an, an octave, which if you look at it visually on the piano, on the uh, slide here, you can see the different octaves, uh, as these dotted lines represent, are all equidistant. So on a piano, um, all those octaves are basically the same spacing. On the violin, it's the same thing. You set an octave, it, it fits into the hand, and you can play it that way. But in actual fact, what's going on mathematically is that vibrations are being doubled. So in the case of a, of a, a piano, uh, the string is vibrating at twice the speed uh, at, at A440 uh, than it is at, say, A220. Uh, so this, this pitch here is happening at 440 hertz per second. And this pitch here is happening at 220. And if I go below that, I'm down to 110. So it just divides itself in half. So it's a logarithmic scale as opposed to an equal scale. So you can actually see that from a pitch point of view, we hear things uh, not in a non-logarithmic way, right, in, in, a, in a sequence, but in, in the actual facts, in mathematics, it's a logarithmic scale. So it's sort of an interesting uh, way to think of it, or an approach to think of it, uh, that it doesn't line up quite like you think it would. Before I get too far, uh, again, I, I don't want to make any assumptions, so I've just given you uh, some note names. Uh, we use seven note names uh, uh, from the or seven letters from the alphabet to denote names in a, in a piano. And essentially, you've got uh, three black keys and two black keys uh, grouping, and those just repeat. Um, so this first key of the group of three is the uh, same note as this group of key, uh, group of three, first note of this group of three, uh, but an octave higher. So you actually have those, um, those repeating patterns, and then they all actually have na uh, names to them. So we use the first seven letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, there's no H unless 
you're using a different German system, which doesn't exist, but I won't worry. Um, and then it goes back to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and just repeats itself. Uh, in between, those are all the white keys, by the way, uh, so there's seven white keys. And then in between those, we have uh, different, uh, what we would call accidentals. So uh, if you have the note A, and you go up a semitone, which is the smallest distance I can move on the piano, uh, I'm essentially going up to the next black key. Then I have A sharp. So I've essentially raised that note, and I've put a sharp in front of it. That's what that little uh, hashtag sign looks like, uh, or number sign looks like. I actually don't tweet, but I thought that might be fun. Uh, Donald Trump is also what that says. Uh, we've got uh, letter, letter uh, G is another note we've got there. And if I go down to letter G, uh, then instead of having F sharp, I've got G flat. So uh, G, uh, F sharp and G flat uh, on the piano actually share the same, the same pitch or the same uh, note. So uh, if someone were to play this note and ask me what it is, I could say it's either F sharp or it's G flat. And I'd be right by the way, uh, listening to it from the piano's perspective. So, um, in actual fact, we'll talk about that they are not the same, the same thing, uh, but on the piano they are, and that's the Myron mentioned uh, sort of a cheating or a compromise, uh, and that's the compromise too, uh, that they think they are equal. So those are uh, essentially the note names of the, of the keyboard, and then uh, the next slide I've got is just uh, talking about an interval. So uh, a lot of the tuning systems we look at today are based, are interval based, and we actually look at how they uh, were derived. Uh, and the most important interval for us is uh, what we call a perfect fit. And an interval essentially is just the different the distance from one note to another. And so there's a perfect fit. And uh, we'll look at why that's important in a minute. But uh, I'm going to bring up uh, another chart of all the uh, actual intervals that we have in, in Western Music or based off of a piano and how to look at those. Um, so I, I brought this phone so I didn't have to walk across the stage. But I'm clearly not using it. Um, so uh, the first one we have is unison, which is essentially the same note again on the piano. You can't play unison because um, I can't get the same note twice uh, out of the same instrument. Uh, but you can get that out of, out of uh, other instruments, out of, a, out of a violin, for example. You can play aha, I see a pocket violin. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll leave that there. So uh, no, no, I've gone ahead. So, uh, and I'm still trying it out, or I'm still talking about but not now. I need to be here. So, uh, unison was the, uh, is the same note, and then after that we get the minor second, which is the smallest interval you can drop on a piano. So C to say C sharp, gives you that small distance called the semitone. I've put uh, alternate names for them on the uh, right hand side in red, right, because these are terms I'll probably use throughout the, the uh, presentation. So uh, it's technically called a minor second, but it's also known as a semitone or a half step is another name we use for it. Uh, we get a major second, which is uh, essentially a whole tone, which is the uh, sorry, let's see, which is basically C going to be uh, in this case the next white note next to it. Uh, so there's a black note in between, which allows it to be a larger space, a larger gap. So I'm going from C to D in that case, uh, which is a different sound. Semitone, whole tone. And uh, we also call that a, a whole step sometimes as well. There's others in there as well, major third, minor third, uh, perfect fourth, and perfect fifth. I've put those in uh, red as well because the perfect fifth is essentially uh, one of the most important uh, uh, intervals in our harmony. Uh, I would argue that the tritone, which is uh, just between the two of them, is actually uh, more important. That's this one here a very dissonant uh, sound, but I'm today just in the perfect fifth, in the perfect fourth. So the perfect fourth is essentially uh, the inverse of the perfect fifth. So we're going to look at why the perfect fifth is important in a minute, and then uh, if we have, for example, the note F, G, A, B, C, it's five notes away, and uh, that's the perfect fifth. If I take the bottom note F and I move it to the top note to move it up an octave essentially, then I get from C to F becomes a perfect fourth. So the inverse, uh, so flipping the bottom note to the top, makes a perfect, four, a perfect fifth a perfect fourth, and vice versa. If you do a perfect fourth, you can invert that and make a perfect fifth. So uh, perfect fourths and perfect fifths are very in tune, uh, which is why they have the uh, perfect label in front of them. Um, the rest of them, uh, the sixths we use a lot in classical harmony, uh, same with the thirds, and then uh, we get into the sevenths and the seconds, more or less for, for jazz later. Um, 
but it's uh, essentially in classical uh, harmony. I'm using classical as a larger umbrella term, not just the classical era of Mozart. Uh, but in classical music, you generally see um, thirds, triads, sixes, that sort of thing. Another term I might uh, use today is called ascent. And ascent essentially uh, refers to a way of um, dividing our second tone. So this is from here to here, it's minor second. Um, you can actually divide that, and these minor seconds in an equal tempered system on the piano are actually all the same distance. And that distance is uh, measured in cents, and we measure that in 100 cents. So there's 100 cents in a semitone. So if I, if I take a note like C, and I raise it 50 cents, then I actually get C quarter sharp. It's not all the way sharp, uh, so it's a note between here and here. Uh, and between that is, is uh, a C, which would be 50 cents sharp, uh, or a quarter tone sharp. Um, and, and on the piano, that doesn't exist, which is why the greatest violin of the violin was the greatest instrument ever invented. <laughs> we get to play all the notes in between. Okay, so um, I'm going to get on to the uh, formal presentation here. Uh, this comic sort of explains my life. I was telling colleagues earlier today that. Uh, I feel like I just fake it until I make it, and I still feel like I fake it every day, so uh, I thought it was appropriate. So I'm going to talk about, uh, about perfect pitch. Um, its technical name is, is absolute pitch, and uh, it's essentially a, a rare phenomenon uh, for people to have it. Uh, people kept on telling me when I was younger that I was, I was special um, because of the perfect pitch. Um, <laughs> Um, but I didn't, I didn't understand that there was another way to hear. I just, I just assumed that people could, could hear that way. That, uh, that without any help, I could just uh, find notes or hear notes or tune notes. So uh, if I get a note or, or if there's a note that needs to be heard, if you want to just like, find an F sharp, F sharp sounds like that, and I can go to the piano and find an F sharp, and I can just hear that in my head. And, and I don't know why that's amazing, but, but apparently it is. People find that, that really interesting. So for my whole life, until I was about 11 or 12, that was um, something I just thought people understood and, and, or listened. And, and it, it, I didn't realize that I had, had a gift. Um, and that gift was really cool. And I could go to parties, and, and people would, would play notes, and they would make sounds, and they would ask me what that is. They'd go to you know, objects. This is always a fun one. And they, what, what note is that? Um, and, I, and I can't tell you what that is because it's, it's a noise. Um, so you, <laughs> You need to have a, a longer uh, frequency, a uh, sustainable frequency, uh, for it to actually work. So, um, you know, and people would ask me silly questions like that, um, like, what's that noise? I would just give them a, a random note, and be like, oh, that's, that's, that's C sharp. And they'd be like, ah, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and I was just lying, but, but it made them feel good, so, so I thought that was kind of fun. So. So that's essentially what, what the gift is. I, I have this ability to, uh, to hear uh, pitches and, and to know what they are and to recall them. And, and like I said, it was, it was fun for a little while. And then it came to the point where uh, in music, it started to uh, give me problems, it started to uh, give me some issues. But, but I'll talk about those issues in a minute. I need a couch. Um, so in terms of how we actually hear perfect pitch, uh, what that actually looks like, it's essentially, from what we know, and, and there's not actually a whole lot known about it, but from what we, we know, my ears aren't special. There's nothing different about my, my ears. My doctor says I have a deviated ear canal, but I don't think that has anything to do with, with that. It's to do with cognition, to do with my brain. And for some reason, I have this ability to, uh, or people with perfect pitch, have this ability to uh, essentially be able to analyze frequencies without actually sitting down and counting 440 hertz. I have this ability to, to hear uh, those, those frequencies and to associate them with, with learned names. Uh, and that's essentially what it is. Um, and I think of that uh, very much like uh, understanding what colors are, right? You guys don't look at colors uh, like the DIU logo up there and sit there and go, oh yeah, that's in the infrared spectrum or whatever. I, I'm probably using the wrong term, but that's you know, in the visual spectrum. And, uh, and I see that as uh, an oscillation at a certain speed. Uh, that's not how it works. You just put that in with blue. And that's how perfect pitch for me works. I uh, hear a note, and it's just it's G, it's F sharp. It's whatever I can hear right away, I recognize it in the same way that we recognize colors. So that's sort of the, the uh, side to it. So whenever people ask me to explain 
how it is, it's just like that. It's, you understand colors, you can recognize colors. Someone told you along the way that that's blue and uh, that you know, all the seats are navy blue and that my shirt is gray. Those things were, were names that you were taught uh, in terms of uh, your, your ability to see things. Your eyes see one thing, you're taught a label for that and then you are able to take that further uh, and, and talk about it with your friends. So in terms of abilities, uh, what kind of things can I do? I talked a little bit about them. But I can identify by name individual pitches played on various instruments. So again, if I just randomly look, or no, if I don't look, and I just play note, I play two notes. Um, but I've got note F, and I can go E4. Um, and if you have a look, what will be, I can see the keyboard. You can see that I hit F and E. So I, without any reference pitch, without ever uh, having looked at anything, I can just, if there's a note on the piano that happens, I can hear that. And I can know what that is. Um, I, I can hear uh, chords and stuff, so if you hit like multiple notes, I can hear that there's an F and uh, a B and, an, and I think an F at the bottom here to hear it again. An E on the bottom. So uh, I can uh, hear chords. When it gets up to like four or five notes, it becomes harder and harder to, to distinguish them from each other. So there's a, cer a certain limit to that. Um, so people will come and try it closer to like, <laughs> what do you hear? And I can hear parts of that. I can usually hear the loudest frequencies of that and pick those apart. Um, but but you, I can't pull out every note. It's not, it's not that easy. So, uh, and a, and a well-voiced chord, uh, it's only ones that make sense. They're much easier to hear because uh, they, they, they have better tonality. They, they ring better. It's easier for the ear to pick them, pick them apart. But clusters like that are much harder to make, make sense of. So. Um, if I'm hearing music on the radio, I can, I can actually uh, hear what that is. Um, in terms of key, so I, I can uh, hear, uh, you know, the latest Justin Bieber album and uh, tell you that track one is in the key of F and then the next song is in the key of F and they're all in the key of F. Um, <laughs> so that, that's kind of a cool skill. And, and then again, if we're, if we're at a party, I can tell the guitar player is playing in playing the wrong key. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a minor annoyance because I tend to associate songs I hear on the radio with the keys that are in when I hear the keys that aren't. Uh, and the key they're in, it kind of annoys me. Um, so that's one of those things that just gets in the way. Um, I can reproduce a piece of tonal music in the correct key. Uh, so again, if I go to a, a movie and I enjoy the soundtrack, uh, I can usually come home and play that soundtrack on the piano because it's not too complicated um, because I know what the notes were. And if I can remember what those notes were, and I can sit down and play the right key, then I'm going to work. So uh, if I have the ability to, uh, to play it, which I'm not actually a great piano player, but if I have the ability to recreate something, uh, then I can actually sit down and, and do that. So um, We talked about uh, identifying chord uh, tones, um, accurately sing uh, a given pitch. So uh, I said one earlier, but if I want to sing A440, oh, that's an octave low because I don't sing that high, but that's A220, I can pull that out of thin air. And uh, again, I can name pitches of common everyday sounds. So as the cars go by or whatever, anything that has a, has a pitch value to it or a long enough frequency, I can usually name it a name of it. And the reality is, is most car horns of the BC theories, uh, thing, or, you know, the, I always remember this one of the TTC in Toronto. Um, these things are usually played out of tune, which become really annoying. Um, so, so the tritone or the, uh, the uh, TTC that uh, descending sound was always just a little bit flat, and that was that was quite annoying. Um, and it's just the way it is. These are these are the this is the curse of, of the perfect pitch. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the problems of perfect pitch. Um, uh, like that, may be uh, distressed upon perceiving tones they believe to be the wrong or hearing a piece in the uh, wrong key. So I talked a little bit about, about that problem. Um, and then this, uh, this happens in a specific case in uh, Baroque music where uh, the musicians actually detune their violins. Um, so in, in modern times, we, we tune what's known as A440, which is the note A, which is like about 440 cycles per second. And that's, that's our tuning pitch. But in the Baroque era, um, technology didn't really allow them to, to be that, that sharp. And I mean that as in, you know, the strings couldn't be that tight, their instruments couldn't have that much tension. Um, and so everything sat down a little bit lower. Uh, it sat around 415, which is a little bit lower. It's, it's, it's almost a semitone. So their, their A is, is a little sharper than this A flat I'm playing for you. But that was essentially uh, where they played, just a little bit above that. And uh, so when I see the letter, uh, the note A, 
on the piece of music. I expect to hear this. And then what comes out of everybody else is this. And that is really, really annoying. Because <laughs> it's like they're playing the wrong notes. Everyone's playing the wrong note. What's, what's the matter with these people? <laughs> and it's not their fault. They're, flat, they're playing everything right. But I'm stuck there trying to deal with that and pick it up. How do I, how do I solve that problem? And we'll, we'll look at that and an example of that in a minute. So uh, I haven't played too much broke music in broke today. Uh, but the good news is, is that after playing with these guys for about an hour, my, my perfect pitch actually adjusts. I try to just forget it, and it actually settles into a new tune. And then after about an hour or two of silence or a good night's sleep, I'll wake up the next day and I'll be ding back and forth forward. So uh, it is movable, but, uh, but it uh, generally sticks at, at a 440. Uh, music can often drift in pitch, uh, was the next uh, statement. This happens a lot in choirs. Uh, so when we, you sing in a choir and then the choir starts going flatter and flatter, it gets to the point where, oh, they're all singing a semitone or a whole tone on a tune. And I look at the note A in the music, and I know how to reproduce the note A. So I see A in the music, I want to sing la, and everyone else is singing la, and so I have to sing, okay, every A is now A flat, so I have to sing A flat to that. So it ends up becoming this game of transposing. And, and I'll, I'll have you guys play that game in a minute. Um, the, the bad news uh, for some people, and I'm really lucky, uh, I, I have uh, wonderful parents, and I, I think my mom's hiding here somewhere, but uh, wonderful parents who uh, gave me a wonderful, um, again, uh, in an army, they set me up with all these wonderful teachers, but my mom was also a piano player, so I had a piano in my, in my uh, house when I grew up, and she had this little overlay, kind of like the, the uh, overlay that showed the that had all the games, and it would just sit on the piano. And uh, my mom would play piano, and I would sit there and watch the clouds go by on, in the skylight, just lay on my back while she practiced. And then she would teach me the name, note names when she had them for practices. And we'd sit down and she'd show me the note names. And uh, thankfully, she tuned her, her piano. So my reference pitch was, again, perfectly uh, 440. Um, it's kind of plus minus five cents on the other side, depending on, on how I'm feeling that day. But generally, it's, it's pretty bang on a 440. Some people tend to be a little, you know, more uh, leeway in the perfect pitch. It's not the same for everybody. So I actually have a fairly uh, well-developed perfect pitch. And um, I thank my mom for having uh, a nice tuned piano because I, I, that was part of it. If the piano was out of tune, then I might learn those associations with the instruments out of tune, which has happened to a lot of people. So some people actually have uh, uh, notes uh, that in their head are just not in equal temperament in our, in our modern tuning system. So they're kind of doubly screwed. And then everything else bothers them. And then even the right stuff bothers them. Uh, so I don't know how has that, that, that problem. Um, there is a, an instance that comes up on violin uh, called scordatura, which is essentially detuning the violin. So again, it would say play the note D on the, on the page. So the D uh, um, notation is there, and then a different note comes on the violin. And that's, that really messes with my brain, because I expect a CD and I expect some of the note D to come out, and it doesn't. Um, so playing scordatura for me is, is like a really real challenge, and I never actually know if, if I'm playing the right things. Uh, the last one is is uh, in true uh, in true fact, uh, as cool as perfect pitch sounds, it's it's not all that useful in music because we don't play in a, in a fixed system. We don't. I mean, a, a piano you're playing in equal temperament, but in violin and orchestra and in large ensembles. You're generally playing in, in different tuning systems, sometimes different tuning systems at the same time. Uh, so I'll talk about that. But first, I want you guys to suffer a little bit, so you can suffer with me. <laughs> so this is uh, how I thought best to explain this idea of, of transposition. So in the top row, the horizontal row, you can see that we've got the colors red, orange, yellow, green, blue. Right. So for, for most of you, uh, I hope that makes sense and that's correct. Now, the next row is what happens when somebody goes out of tune. So you've got the color blue, but, but everyone else is in red. And then you see orange, but everyone else is in red. Okay, I'm sorry. No, I just, it's just the color. Um, it's just the it's projector. So you've got orange, it's actually red. And you've got yellow, it's orange. You've got green. So it all gets displaced by, by one. And, um, and that becomes, uh, again, problematic um, for us. Because if you have to sight read, and this is, these are ones without labels. So if I were to tell you guys to go and play this at this tempo and get all the note names right, you're going to see that the problem, right? What color is that? Well, we see it as green, but you have to remember that green is now blue, and that orange is now yellow, and so you have to go through that problem. 
So that's, that's the issue with, with the transition. That's what we go through in perfect pitch when our notes are out of tune. Uh, and what's, what we see on the page is different than what we hear. And that's what it feels like. So doing that in real time, or at like do, 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 is really, really, really taxing on the brain. And it's not just a matter of, oh, I'll just move my hand down a half step and then it'll work. It, 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 it doesn't quite work like that uh, in any way. So that's the, that's the idea of transposition. So I want to talk a little bit about um, tuning systems. And the idea of tuning systems uh, uh, that I've got here, the three that I'm pre presenting are essentially the, the main ones we use uh, today. There's many, many more, but these are sort of the, the three uh, that I want to talk about. Pythagorean, just intonation, and equal temperament. So Pythagorean tuning uh, came from this guy, Pythagoras. Uh, he's like some Greek dude. I, I don't you could probably haven't heard of him, but he's just this like, um, you know, philosopher and mathematician guy, just a small name. And um, he decided one day, in fact, he was walking down the street and, uh, in his sandals, it wasn't a street it was like a path. And, uh, and he heard uh, in a blacksmith shop somebody hitting the anvil and striking a blade and, and making uh, some tools. He heard ding, dong, ding, dong, he heard these different sounds. And so he decided to take metal bars and actually divide them into uh, different lengths and start hitting them. And then realized there was a, you know, a, a ratio uh, and these notes that would come out of it. Um, so here's a famous photo of him uh, taking that a step further and turning it into uh, different side bells. And um, essentially he discovered that uh, if you take a, uh, a note, like this one here, on the middle C, and then if you take that, that bar or that string, you divide it, you cut off a third of it, then you get this. That's the note that comes out of it. And that's the angle that we call it the fifth. So he basically took these perfect fifths and uh, he, he went like this. I'm going to start here, but I'm going to jump around with it. So he took that perfect fifth and went from C to G, and, and he got two notes, C, what we call now C, and a note we call G. And then he took that note, G, the new note, and went a fifth above that. And so now he's got D. And he went to the next note, and he kept on adding fifths on top of each other. And he kept on going. And then we end up back at C. So he kept on adding these notes, uh, these fifths, and eventually he ended up coming back to C, or roughly C. Um, I don't need to get into it, but the C at the bottom and the C at the top don't match, and it's a big problem called the Pythagorean comma, but we won't get into it today. But needless to say that it's an imperfect system, but what came from it was some pretty cool things. First of all, it's the basis of our 12-tone system. So the 12 notes um, that we have on the piano and these 12 notes being C, C sharp, D, E flat, E, F, F sharp, G, E sharp, A, E flat, E, and then back to C. Uh, those, those 12 notes uh, come from Pythagoras, from this, this uh, perfect fifth repeating. And we use a tool called the circle of fifths uh, that is actually still in use today for our key centuries and understanding how, how that all works. So it's a huge part of our, of our theory system now. So I'm going to look at what Pythagorean uh, tuning does for the, for the violin and for the scale. So I'm actually going to put the mic down and, and uh, do some playing. So the violin itself, can you guys still hear me all right? Yeah. So the violin itself is uh, tuned in fifths. So we use the same A440 off the middle of the piano. Mm -hmm. itself is tuned in fifths, so I've got A as my tuning note, and a fifth above that, I've got the E, and then a fifth below that, I've got my D, and a fifth below that, I've got the G. So this idea in uh, Pythagorean tuning is that uh, you would take a note, in this case we've got the note uh, D uh, on the slide there, and the next note, uh, E, um, how do we find that, what that next note would be? Well, E is it's quite a long ways away, it's here. If I go up to the perfect fifth here, and then I go a perfect fifth here, here's my E, and if I find it down here, and match them, then I can hear what, uh, what my D and my A sound like together, or my, my D and my E. So here's my E, and my D. So they're, they're uh, what we call a whole 
steps apart, and they're a fairly wide whole step uh, compared to what you might find on Pythagorean uh, on uh, equal temper tuning. So generally, we think of, of uh, whole steps uh, in Pythagorean tuning as quite wide, and we think of semi tones as quite narrow. So if I keep going, I've got this one. So I'm taking my open E, and I'm tuning a perfect fourth, which is one of those intervals that's perfect, right? We know that the perfect fifth uh, is a clean interval in Pythagorean tuning and equal temperament. Uh, and if I take uh, this and invert it, I get a perfect fourth, so it's a nice and tuned um, interval. So all these uh, notes that are showing up on the, on the slide here are all derived from perfect fifths and perfect fourths. So I'm taking my perfect fourth, and I'm going backwards. And as a result, I get this note here which is an F sharp, which is the third note in a, in a major scale. Right? And then I've got my open G, but to make it the next note of the scale, I've got to go up the octave, tune that octave. So I get a sound like this. Which means that my F sharp is quite, quite hot when it actually exists in that form. The F sharp here isn't quite as hot. So in, in a major third, it sounds a little bit better uh, if you're using Pythagorean tuning to actually run the, the uh, sharp higher than you would on equal temperament. Um, so uh, generally on violin, when it comes to melodies and that sort of thing, we essentially use the Pythagorean tuning because it tends to impart a bit more emotion. So um, there are some that are out of tune. Um, I'm not going to get into them right now because I know I'm going to run out of time. So I'm just going to move on to the other tuning system that we have, which is known as just intonation. So Pythagorean, wide, uh, wide whole tones, narrow semitone, and all based off of perfect fits. Now, uh, in just intonation, uh, we've got some, some uh, background information to catch up on. We need to talk about a harmonic series, uh, a phenomenon called beating, and uh, difference tone. So the harmonic series is essentially taking a string length, so the very top one there is what we'd call the fundamental, and it's basically, uh, on the violin here, it's basically going from this node here to this node here, or from the bridge to the, to the nut. And it's just the, vi the, the string vibrating its full length, and that makes the note, in this case, G. And if I divide that note in half with my finger, I can actually get that octave above it. So the first note in the harmonic series is, uh, is actually of the octave. So I have my, my open note here. And then I can actually use what's called a harmonic, which means I'm not pressing my finger to the string to play. If I press my finger to play, it sounds like this. But if I make a harmonic, it sounds like this. It's a bit of a different sound. The difference is, is when I press my finger to play, the string vibrates from my finger to the bridge. But if I press my finger only halfway down, the string vibrates from my finger to the bridge and from my finger to the nut. So it's vibrating on both sides of my finger. Uh, because it exists naturally in the nature of that division. So you probably won't be able to see it, but you can hear it. You just might be able to see the string go fuzzy. I probably not, but. but that's the first harmonic. And then if I divide the string into thirds, I get that perfect fifth I was talking about. There's the fifth. And then if I keep going, into quarters, I get another fifth, or another octave, which makes perfect sense. Here's my fundamental. I cut that into half. I get an octave. I cut that into half again. And I get another octave, right? So the quarter and a half are, are related. And then if I go again further into fifths, I get this note here, B. And then I get another fifth as I go. So as I keep dividing these string lengths, I get different notes. And the crux of just intonation is to take notes that exist within this system or within these divisions, notes that belong to the actual uh, division of your, of your notes, or of your string rather, uh, that you can actually um, tune to those. So when someone plays taps on the drum on the bugle, and you make this, those are all notes from the harmonic series. That's why there's no buttons on the horn, because they can access a whole bunch of notes just by dividing that column of air, in their case, into different uh, nodes and accessing those different nodes. So that's the idea there. Um, so here's what the harmonic series looks like on paper. So uh, if you were to actually go through the harmonic series in its entirety, you would actually hear that, that sound. So we go from here, we get our first octave, and we get our G. Divisions. 
So within that, we get things like octaves, perfect fifths, perfect fourths, major thirds, minor thirds, minor seconds. We get all those intervals that we were talking about, and those all exist in that. So whenever you're playing a piece of music, and you need to play a major third or a perfect fourth, you can actually derive those from this scale. Now the thing is, you know, and you might notice that uh, there's sin deviations along the top. And I've put this on the note, note, note uh, sin deviations from equal temperament. So uh, what I play for you with equal temperament, and that's all notes that are tuned properly. But in actual fact, if I take one of these notes and divide them, when I get to the B flat, uh, so if in this case with the key of C, when I get to the B flat, the, the B, uh, seventh uh, harmonic there, it's actually 31 cents flat out of 100. So it's like a third flat, essentially. You get to uh, the 11th harmonic, the tritone from here to here, that sound there, it's 49 cents flat. It's an actual, uh, if it was 50 cents, it would be an actual quarter tone. So to our ears, this from here to here does not exist in nature. It doesn't exist on the string. It actually becomes a quarter, uh, a quarter tone flat for it to work. So I can actually break it down show you on the camera by dividing this one. So I'm just going to find harmonics here. So that's the first harmonic. And I'm going to divide two more. There's another one there. There's the B flat compared to this. See the difference? Quite a lot flatter. That's the 31 cents. So, uh, in actual fact, based on, on a string, uh, if you divide it, you get different tones that, that don't exist uh, in equal temperament. So, when you're playing uh, a sound on, on the violin that actually sound, uh, that's using uh, a different note, uh, how do I say, double stops? If you guys don't know what that term means, it means playing more than one note at once. So, if I'm playing a fundamental pitch, um, even if it's a fingered one, and then I'm going to use a different tone to play at the same time, I actually want to tune it to a note that exists on, on its fundamental frequency. And then it'll actually come alive. It becomes much brighter and makes much more sense uh, to our ears. It sounds fuller. So um, this is when we get into uh, these issues here. I'm going to talk about beating. Uh, so what happens when you have two notes playing at the same time is they uh, actually combine to make a different type of wave. So the first note is a uh, frequency at 10 hertz. Uh, the next one's a frequency at 8 hertz. And then the difference between the two is what we call a different uh, difference tone of 2 hertz. So it actually, you can see the waveforms in some places. We get wave addition, where the waves actually uh, stack up on each other, make a stronger waveform. And in some places, we get wave cancellation, where this peak is in an upwards position, this peak's in a downwards position. They cancel each other out, and you get a much less of a, of a sound. So you actually get strong, weak, strong, weak, which is called beating. And that's what we use to tune our instruments. So when we go to the orchestra, the orchestra plays the oboe, plays the tuning note A, sounds like this. And then we all join in and we play A with them. So I'm going to play a unison here. And I know that the note is working when I don't hear any wah, 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 wah kind of sound. So I'm going to start the note in tune and play uh, two notes at the same time. I'm going to slowly pull one out of tune and see if you guys can hear it going, oh, wah, 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 and that'll become a faster sound. So here we go. You guys hear that wah, 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 wah sound? So that's the sound of beating, and that's not a good thing. So when those two sounds come together and the beating is gone, I know I'm perfectly in tune with the other musician. And that means that the beating, these, uh, these cancellations will disappear, and what the two of us will make a much stronger, wider sound. So this is relevant to just intonation uh, for a different reason. So uh, what happens in, in, uh, in um, just gonna have a look. Uh, what happens is we use the beating tuner instruments, and then uh, when you have a, um, a chord, so if I were to play this, for example, these aren't the same note, and there's actually a, a, a beating or a difference tone between them that's going wah, 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 wah. So if I were to take this note, and the start where I was in tune, and, and the beating started to slow, like, wah, 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 and then that, that uh, beating becomes faster and faster and faster, the farther away I go, that third tone, that, that difference tone, actually becomes 
uh, a note of the chord. So when I play this, this chord in tune, this, you guys won't hear this, but I hear, I hear this. That difference tone is a, a note that belongs to that chord. So when I'm tuning using just intonation, uh, I'm actually hearing uh, natural divisions in the string. I'm hearing the notes uh, combining in a natural way, a way that it can occur in nature, and then that difference tone as a result ends up being a part of the chord. Well, if I go to the minor third, then I actually get this note. You hear that one. So a little farther apart. Sorry, I, I got the back of major third, minor third. Uh, so when I go to the major third, I get the, um, uh, the interval becomes slightly wider, the difference tone goes up in pitch, and it becomes a higher note, but also still part of the chord. Uh, so difference tones are really important to violin playing because they actually bring more fullness to the, to the sound. So when I play in a string quartet or an orchestra, I'm always looking for that spot where my pitch will actually settle in or will actually make the sound sound fuller and warmer and bigger as opposed to pitch that, that, that um, does the opposite, gets in the way, gets in that interference. And uh, having perfect pitch, that is not the pitch I hear in my head. Right? I hear a different pitch. Um, so I've had to basically ignore my instincts, ignore what I hear, and play a totally different sound that makes the group sound fuller. And the first time I remember hearing this was when I was uh, at university uh, in Toronto. So after I left the IU, I went to York University. And I played a concert, and I was really proud of the work we did. I had a recording of it, and I went home and I listened to the recording. And I thought to myself, man, we really sound out of tune. I sound great. I sound really in tune. Like, like I, I'm dead on pitch. I, I'm hitting you know, most of my stuff. But our group sounds out of tune. And it was th at that moment that I realized that intonation is not a fixed thing. It's not something that you buy from a tuner and you match the tuner's pitch. It's a matter of being in tune with the people you're playing. So if the cello plays a note, uh, it's my job to match. He's the, he's the bass, he's the fundamental, he's the, the ground there. It's my job to match his pitch or her pitch. In this case, it was a, a gentleman I was playing with. Um, so it's my job in that case not to be right, you know, but my job to be in tune uh, on top of that. So that was the big dilemma for me. Good. Um, so we, we've essentially talked about all that, so I'm just gonna sneak ahead. Um, so the difference between Pythagorean tuning and just intonation um, is essentially this, um, that um, Pythagorean tuning, uh, we found out it has wide whole steps, narrow semitones, but uh, just intonation uh, does not share the same notes. And I, I've got a musical example I can show you that, that, uh, that does this, uh, that, that provides this example. And it's by, uh, by J.S. Bach. So I actually have a slide here with the piece of music. I'm not gonna play the whole thing um, in fact, I'm just going to play the first part, uh, which sounds like this. That was more than the first part, but um, it was almost the first thing, the first line. So the problem here is that I start off the piece with a, with a chord. And then I've got a melody that follows. So the, the bottom of the chord is open G and D. And the top of the chord is this interval. Now if I go with Pythagorean tuning, then my interval is going to sound out of tune. So I'm going to go with this. I'm going to take my bottom G and match my top G. I'm happy there. I'm going to make my B flat and my G in tune. And the problem is, is as the, the piece progresses, I have this phrase. And that B flat sounds wrong now, doesn't it? I haven't moved it. So in this context of the chord, that one sounds wrong. So when I play this piece, I actually have to play it in tune for the chord. And then set my B flat lower. So I'm actually switching from just intonation on the first note to Pythagorean intonation to make it actually sound more in tune, more pleasing to your ears. Um, and I'm not using equal temperament at all. 
Uh, because equal temperament on the violin, we don't have frets, we're not stuck with that. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to, to compromise in the first place. Um, so uh, what actually happens is we get, um, just checking my time here. We started at 10, right? Yeah. So, uh, so we've got um, Bach, who came along, and in Bach's time, they had uh, Pythagorean tuning, of course, and they had just intonation. They're well aware of that, of that uh, phenomenon. Uh, and they actually had a system called mean tone t uh, tuning, which I'm not going to talk about. But basically, it meant that the, the important keys were in tune, uh, and the, uh, it was like basically discriminatory. And the uh, keys don't use so often were out of tune. And uh, and then Bach sort of wanted to come along and, and try creating a system where you could uh, actually play in all 12 keys um, without having to retune the instrument. Because the, the problem that would arrive uh, if you use just intonation is you can tune your, your piano perfectly so it works in the key of C. And everything in the key of C sounds wonderful. And then you go to the key of C sharp and everything sounds awful. So the idea of changing keys um, is, is not a possibility for us anymore, right? Or it's a, a, a really long possibility in terms of, okay, bring up the tools, let's just readjust the harp support here. And oh, let's, just, uh, let's just change the uh, tuning on the harp here. Those things take time and it's not convenient. So the composers uh, at the time would take uh, songs, they'd use related keys. So the first key would start in the key of G major. And then they would go and play, hey, let's play the next key in, in the key of E minor, which has the same keys in terms of essentially the same tuning system. So they would have these related keys uh, that wouldn't, they didn't have to transpose or retune the instruments. Uh, but, but Bach thought, well, why don't I create a cycle of pieces uh, on a new tuning system? Uh, and it wasn't equal temperament, but it was sort of on its way there, called well-tempered. Uh, which was basically a compromise to try to get everything uh, to work. And he came up with um, 48 um, preludes, etudes, uh, fugues, sorry. And uh, the first one you probably don't know is. So he came up with that piece uh, as being a C major option. Then he wrote another one on the key of C minor. And then he wrote a fugue in C major and a fugue in C minor. And then he went out and did another set, C sharp major. And et cetera, et cetera. So he went and did one for every key um, using his, this tuning system called Well Tempered. And, and a very famous uh, piece of music called the uh, 24 uh, Preludes and 24 Fugues in all 12 keys, uh, or the Well Tempered from here. So uh, that was his, uh, his sort of contribution to equal temperament, and it was uh, then sort of brought on uh, into real, uh, it, it improved over time. Uh, and so now uh, we've got a 12 tone system in which all these semitones are completely the same distance apart. It's a compromise. Uh, we tune to A440, and we can go from one key to another uh, on the piano without any problems. But uh, in orchestral playing, if I play an equal temperament, uh, or if I play on the piano, for example, if I play with an equal temperament instrument, then my sound, my fullness, my openness of my instrument is not being taken advantage of. So it, it's a compromise on my end, uh, and one that I don't always enjoy. So um, that sort of becomes the problem. And the other side of it for me, which sort of brings the uh, brings this full circle, is that my my perfect pitch is actually in equal temperament as well. So not only do I not um, is it is it a struggle for me to uh, hear my violin not ringing as well, but I'm also sitting there again thinking, well, that's in tune. Now I have to break the rules and, and get my violin sounding as good as it can. And that's been a, a, a big, long struggle for me. I've always sort of struggled with, with intonation uh, in that sense because I don't know that I ever really knew where, where to put it or where, where, to, where to place it. So, um, so that's sort of the, the issue of perfect pitch in, in, in a, at least on a, on a string instrument. If you're a piano player, it's probably not the end of the world because you just press a button and, and the, the instrument's tuned for you. But when you play in scenarios that require uh, different tuning systems, then this is certainly, uh, the perfect pitch is, is an absolute curse. So, um, I was gonna talk about the advantages and disadvantages of, of equal temperament, but I think I'm sort of getting near the end of time here. Um, but essentially, we, we mentioned them. The advantages are you can transpose. Um, the intervals that are, are out of tune um, aren't that bad, so the, the perfect fifths are quite good. And then the um, perfect fourths, so obviously the inverse are fine. Uh, the major thirds, the major, uh, the sixes, they're okay, um, which is in classical music, again, there's such a, uh, an emphasis on, on, on uh, tertiary harmony, but uh, you get use of thirds and sixes a, a lot. Uh, but some of the other ones, like the seventh, the flat seven I was showing you guys, uh, 
is, is a problematic chord. So uh, when you play a dominant seventh chord, which is like the crux of modern art, then this is um, so those ones, some of the uh, exterior extensions become out of tune. Um, so many, many notes are only slightly out of tune. Only a few notes are badly out of tune, and the B flat being one of them. Uh, so it, um, all right, I'm going to leave that alone. Good. So I was sort of talking about uh, string players uh, suffering uh, in, in equal temperament, and it's true. Uh, and then that example I was showing you when I, when I was playing, as a, uh, as a musician in that uh, ensemble, uh, that if you're playing in equal temperament, your group doesn't actually sound all that good. And you have to make, or it doesn't sound in tune, and you have to make decisions as a group or as an ensemble uh, as to when to use uh, Pythagorean, when to use just. Um, perhaps you might choose to use equal temperament. But when you play, uh, most of the time when there's chordal work going on, you're using just intonation. And most of the time when you're, there's passage work, sort of horizontal motion, then uh, you're essentially using that Pythagorean. And sometimes you have passage work in uh, quartet playing that doesn't allow, uh, you know, you have four parts basically going at once. And so, you know, do you all use Pythagorean or do you try to line up your four chords because there's vertical and horizontal right at the same time? So you have to sort of decide who's got the most important melody and then the rest of us are going to support that. So there's a bit of cheating involved. And that's where the, where the rehearsal process comes in. So I think to close it up, my, uh, my last uh, slide here is, given the choice, would I give up perfect pitch? And I think the short answer to that is no. Um, I wouldn't. It would, I think it would just feel, feel weird um, to, to, to hear like everyone else. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I mean that because it's, it's, it'd be like, uh, uh, like it's like you just had this thing your whole life and then to, to, to have it you'd have to relearn. So it seems like a whole lot of work to go the other way. But um, that being said, I feel like there's a, a huge advantage to, to students that don't have to have this. And a lot of people come to me and ask me, oh, James, you're so lucky. And it's like, I try to tell them, you know, it's actually a curse. It's not something you should be lucky about. I've had to unlearn it to, to, to sort of work in, the, in a scenario where, where playing music uh, fits well or playing my instrument in, in context works. So, um, you know, students use, uh, and are taught in our, in our courses, how to use um, the other one, by blank, um, relative pitch. And uh, relative pitch is basically this idea that we give you a reference note. So here's note C. And from that given note C, you can find any of the other notes. And you're using your ear and your skill to match other notes. So if I play this, one of the musicians can tell you, you want to tell me what that is? Minor six, and if the first note was C, one note would this be a, a flat, right? So with that reference tone, students uh, without the ability to, to see that and actually have that same skill uh, and someone with perfect pitch, and they actually learn to hear those those differences between tones in a much much better better way. Uh, I always just took it for granted I could hear it, and then I actually had to unlearn it and learn how to hear it in many ways, uh, like students do. Um, but, uh, but there is something romantic and something fun about just pulling your violin out and tuning and not relying on a tuner or a tuning note. Um, so would I give it up? No. But is it, is it sort of a, a pain in my butt? Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, so thank you very much for coming. <laughs>